Hi everybody, David Capes, your host for Exegetically Speaking and director of your friendly neighborhood theological library. Now we have reason to celebrate. Why? Because with this episode by Ingrid Farrow, we have reached a milestone, 200 episodes of Exegetically Speaking. I want to thank our Wheaton-based team, Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and John Lonsma, for all the work they've done on this podcast since it began in 2018. Thanks to all the scholars and students who have been our guests and taken up the challenge, the challenge basically to talk about these amazing texts in their original languages in just seven to eight minutes. They, they always could have said more, and very often they did. Finally, thanks to our faithful listeners for subscribing and listening to this podcast and sharing this podcast with other people. We are ready for the next 100 episodes. Hey, keep listening. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ingrid Farrow, and I am the coordinator of the MA in Old Testament program at Northern Seminary, and I teach the Hebrew Bible. Dr. Ingrid Farrow, it's great to see you. Thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thank you, David. So good to be here. We're face-to-face. We're not doing this over Zoom. Which is refreshing. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, to actually be somewhere and do something yep. like that. But uh, we're so glad. This is your second visit to the Lanier Theological Library, and you're doing a lecture here on entitled Deconstructing Evil. We'll have some show notes that direct people to that lecture, and uh, we hope that they'll tune in to that as well. But we're going to talk today about Genesis chapter 2. You've written a book called Evil in Genesis. Yes. And it's a terrific book, really highly recommended, and your story is so compelling. But today, we're looking at Genesis 2, 21 to 22. Tell us what's going on in that passage. In this passage, there are some exegetical gems that are usually overlooked, Mm. even in my wonderful Hebrew studies and my uh, educational process. So this is a little gem from Genesis 2, looking at, I'll read from the English, this is the NASB. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Uh So the main word I'm looking at here is the word translated in just about every translation as rib, Uh but we'll also look at the word built, because usually, like here at the NASB, they use fashioned, or they'll say formed. Yes. But the word here, yivne, from the word to built, and he built. So why would God build a rib? I've heard jokes when I was in my exegetical classes. There were jokes about God uh, building a woman and a woman being built. and um, All those kind of things. All yeah. of those kind of things. Yeah. Must have been a bunch of guys, probably. It was. Yeah, I was yeah. usually one of two women in a class of about 20 or 30. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the men would snicker and the women would roll their eyes. Yes. But they completely missed those wonderful scholars. So this word rib, tzelah, uh-huh. is the word for rib. And so all of you Hebrew people, look it up. It's used twice here. But this word tzelah mm. occurs 40 times, roughly 40 times in the Hebrew Bible. Every other instance, it is translated side, or it might have a word with it like side plank or side board, but it is a word that means side. So why is it translated rib here? And what theological gem can we get an insight into this passage that we may have missed? So this is exciting. So that is pretty good. All right, so why is it translated, you think, why do you think it's translated rib instead of side? If it's side everywhere else. Yeah, I think simply just tradition. Somewhere mm. it was passed along, and somehow it just became rib. Rib seems right because the side of a person is a rib, and so that just became tradition. Mm. So somewhere mm. in the early translations, it got translated rib and so forth, mm. so it just sort of continued from there. But if we look at the passage, and we look at the context, it was not good that the Adam was alone, and so he created a woman who would be an Ezer Kenegno, so uh, a woman of strength, someone strong alongside of him. Hmm. And so, but this word, Selah, adds more to that. Hmm. So if we look at how was this person going to be a companion, what did that mean? So we know the word Ezer 
it uh, is a word that it occurs that occurs 21 times in the Hebrew Bible. 16 of those times it refers to God as our strength. Uh, it's referring to God as our strength. Yeah. So we know that this person who's a companion is supposed to be there for strength, but this word selah adds an additional component. So yeah. we understand, and scholars have pretty well accepted the fact in Genesis 1 is talking about a cosmic temple. So yeah. God created the earth as his cosmic temple or tabernacle. But what we missed is the role of the woman and the man together also has temple imagery. There's also ah. sacred space mm -hmm. implicated here because Hebrew has other words for the word side. So there are other terms that can be used for side. Pe'ah, for example, is one of the main ones, the side of a river, the side of a table, the side of a fence, the, the south side, the north side. So, hmm. uh, so again, mm -hmm. that's a, a predominant word. But this word, selah, is very specific in the Hebrew Bible. And in all but one of the 40 occurrences, it is referring to sides of something that has to do with sacred space. Oh. So that sacred space, for example, Exodus, this word selah specifically used to refer to the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. That's mm. Exodus 25. Exodus 26, it's referred to use to the sides, the frame of the tabernacle. Interesting. It's re used to refer to the sides in Exodus 27 of the bronze altar and the sides of the altar of incense. So it is specifically in Exodus used building terms for a sacred space. Wow. See, I, I didn't know that. That's very, I learn something every time I do this podcast. It's so fun. That's really interesting. Yeah. So how do you, how do you see, are Adam and Eve then serving as priests there? Uh, priestess kind of thing, or what, what, how do you see that kind of role then in, in this sacred space? We do see, of course, the language in uh, Genesis 2 of serve and protect, sometimes translated, I think, weekly, you know, till and cultivate. But mm. those scholars recognize serve and protect are priestly terms, re referring frequently to the role of the priests within the temple, within the tabernacle. Mm. And so here, what I see the fact that, that God built the woman as the side and then everywhere else, including Ezekiel all the way through, the sides of the tabernacle, the sides of the temple, the side storerooms, everything referring to sacred space. This union of the man and the woman, when they are operating together, standing strong together, and uh, and of course the sides of the Ark of the Covenant, they, there had to be a similarity in strength and size, otherwise it would be wonky. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it just wouldn't hold up. It the tabernacle. They each other, right, they, they this, in terms of strength. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. And again, the predominant use is like of the plank. So that's, you could think of the ribs of the tabernacle, the ribs of mm -hmm. the, the temple and so forth, and the, right. the side storerooms. But the male and female operating together, that is the place where the presence of God is to be ushered in. So just as in the New Testament talks about we are the temple, of the Holy Spirit. Mm. We are a sacred space for God, and the church is the temple of the living God. Male and female, in union together, working together, are supposed to be the place where, where people can see the presence of God coming in and going. That is why it's so hard also yeah. for male and female so often to get along. But that is the image God gives us. We are to be supplementing each other, true companions where God's presence is made known uniquely in the earth. Mm, that's a beautiful reading of that text. Ingrid Farrow, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thank you. What a great conversation. I hope you agree. Now, there's only 168 hours until the next podcast drops, so watch for it. Subscribe to this podcast, rate us today. If you want to study biblical languages, you need to consider Wheaton College. They have the best program in the country, bar none. Go to wheaton.edu, look for modern and classical languages, get started today. Come on, you know you want to. Thanks for those who make this podcast possible. John Lonsma is our Wheaton-based director, Ian Rosine and Rebecca Larson. Thanks to Phil Keggy for our music. Until next time, thanks for listening.